Hey, hi, and welcome again, everybody. This is podcast number 54 from danjohnuniversity.com. Hello and welcome. Well, hey, everybody. Uh, I'm in a different location than usual. Um, I'm on a short vacation. Uh, uh, my wife and I, uh, we're down at her mom's place in beautiful Mesquite, Nevada, which uh, is hot enough to melt the asphalt off the ground this week, but we both needed a short break. Uh, Mesquite's uh, really a, a nice town. In fact, I am looking towards uh, maybe even uh, picking up a place here. Uh, one thing about this uh, particular trip, since I drove, I was able to bring uh, some extra equipment with me to train. Uh, almost universally, I always travel with my uh, Brett Contreras glute loop, and basically I just do a lot of hip thrusts, uh, clamshells, and uh, perfect push-ups. Those are those push-ups where you uh, <laughs> you come down, put your hands when you hit the ground, bring them back, and push up. Uh, for me, clamshells, hip thrusts, and some just some push-ups, especially in a couple days, a day or two, is, is, is all I really need to that and walk around, is all I really need physically. Uh, I've actually found that sometimes not training on these road trips works out really well because sometimes I'll go weeks at a time with training five plus five, six, seven days a week. And then the road trip gives me a kind of a nice little break. But on this trip, because uh, we drove, I, I took down my 28 kilo kettlebell. And when I train on the road with a kettlebell, I only do one exercise and that is clean and press. Um, you, you'd probably wonder, well, couldn't you also do swings? Couldn't you also do goblet squats? Couldn't you also, yeah, I could do a million things. But when I'm on the road, one of the things I try to remind myself is that you're on the road, you're vacationing, uh, you're supposed to be having some fun, some R&R. &R. Uh, and the reason I like to clean and press, I you know, I hate that stupid question about if you could only do one exercise, what would it be? But you know, the kettlebell clean and press is, is a might be in that ballpark for those perfect exercises. So uh, when I'm down here, I'll, I'll give you an example of what I do in just a few minutes. Maybe it won't be on this podcast, but um, I'll show you what I do really with the 28 being not really heavy, but not really light. Um, I kind of play around with this idea of doing like one day I do nothing but doubles um, and I'll work up to 25 or 50 total, total reps. Um, I said 25 and I said doubles, but it makes sense in my head. As I, as I let the left arm dictate the, the reps from my right arm, uh, another day I might do sets of three or sets of five. And again, just try to tally up to a number like um, that 25, 50, or 100. Uh, I'll do that. That if, if I was gone for two weeks, I'd probably have one 100 rep day. But that's 100 left and 100 right, just for clarity. Um, and that's all I do uh, on the road. Uh, in the past, I would be a lot more adventurous, a lot more vigorous. But I always worry uh, my workouts are going to take me away from what I'm supposed to be doing on the trip. Uh, one of the things that's kind of nice about this trip, and it's a little unusual, is that uh, I had planned a whole bunch of books to read when I got down here. And, and then my mother-in-law has this book called Divergent here on the shelf. And I said, you know, I watched that movie on a plane trip. So I started reading it. And one of the things I'd like to, you just to kind of think about is that I think in the last about two decades... The murder mystery genre has really not as good as it used to be. God, I'm a so good. Ah, back in the day, we had real murder mysteries. But uh, it's all become kind of, uh, uh, you know, police detective who, you know, he's, uh, he's on the right side of the law, but the wrong side of his boss. And lawyer dramas, which are, I, I can't stand. Uh, um, but one thing I've noticed in the last 20 years, and it's, and a, new, it's a new title, it's called Young Adult Fiction. And it's weird because I think they shoved Harry Potter into it because otherwise Harry Potter books would be the number one bestsellers on time forever. Um, but, you know, there's like the first Hunger Games, which I thought was really a good book. I didn't like the, the, the next two. Um, this Divergent series is, is a, a remarkable book. But it is interesting, I think, that science fiction, fantasy, uh, you know, the Wizards kind of fantasy has all morphed into this area now called young adult fiction and I, and I think it's probably the most uh, some of the best reading uh, I've done in a while uh, I'm enjoying the book and uh, that's one of the nice things about travel uh, I do pick up a book an author I've never heard of sometimes I read their entire canon of work after that so uh, that's what I do on trips I, I have a lot of fun I read books I've never read before and I do a little bit of working out
Let's get to some questions. Don't want to make sure I don't give, give up that gun show. We have a question from Carlos. He says, how long do you wait before exploring new classes, certs, books, etc.? Well, that's, I don't know what you mean. Like, in nowadays, Carlos, because of COVID? Well, I'm going to wait to take a new class uh, when we got the all clear. And, you know, we're not going to, I'm not going to spread this terrible disease to someone I love who might not have my immune system at age 63 with a history of pleurisy. But uh, generally, uh, Carlos, I, I, I was trying there for a couple of years, one thing a year. Uh, I tried real hard. It's interesting that uh, I signed up for the MoveNet uh, workshop and it got canceled because I was the only register. Uh, or, um, you know, uh, I try real hard to stay ahead. Areas like, uh, oh, nutrition and recovery, things I don't know very well. Not that idiotic recovery stuff, Carlos. You know, you, you invent things, you know, and, you know, like... Uh, I, I know in about 15 years I'll be explaining to people what the hell happened at the 2012 Olympics when everybody's wearing duct tape. Uh, I talked to my uh, doctor and my surgeon about this idea where you try to use tape to pull a muscle into place. And they're both like, well, we went to medical school. We do that with, you know, incisions and, 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 and stitches. Uh, so, yeah, about uh, I try once a year. It doesn't always work out. Obviously, this year is a little different. Uh, if you do sit with me at a workshop, Carlos, you're going to be sitting in the front row, and we're going to get there early and stay late, so it'll be fun to have you. What is your process of taking a class, understanding what you learned and implementing in your coaching before you learn about something else? Um, so, Carlos, I'm a big believer in synergy. Uh, so, if I go to a mobility course, I like to see how it ties in what I know from the yoga tradition, what I know from Tim Anderson's. Uh, original strength, uh, maybe a few other mobility people I've talked with through the years at different workshops. And what I try to do is, the first thing I try to do, Carlos, is okay, what, what, is, what is the big rocks? <clears throat> what is real about, uh, it's, it's Venn diagram work. But by the way, Venn diagram work is really a good thing to do. So if Tim Anderson says to do this, the yoga tradition says to do this, and this other tradition says to do this, whatever this is, well, then I run with it. And if we're doing a little bit of it, we might do more of it. Uh, but that's, that's kind of how I try to do it. Um, here of late, it seems like I've bitten off more than I can chew with some of the courses I've enrolled in, and I'm missing more than I'm learning. Um, yeah, sometimes that's why I believe in this, this idea of trying to pull out uh, the, the big rocks, the, syner the synergistic things, the things that are, if it's true here and it's true there, it's weird because when I first started with kettlebells, I think I actually helped the kettlebell community, is they were using phrases from Olympic lifting and powerlifting, but literally uh, 180 degrees opposite of the way we would say it in those communities. And one of the things I tried to get them to do is we have to, we have to make sure we add that, that hint of clarity when we're talking about something like the, the clean or the snatch. Um, you know, they were talking about quiet elbows in the kettlebell clean. Well, uh, in the barbell clean, you know, you have these huge whips. So for me, whipping elbows. So for me, one of the things that provides clarity for me is I always sit down after, after every workshop, after every perform better, after everything in my journal usually, but sometimes in the notebook itself. And then if I write in the notebook, then I have to copy it in my journal. So. Maybe save, save uh, one thing. And I just write down anywhere between the three and ten biggest points I heard on the weekend. Very often, it's the points that every single speaker said again and again and again. Um, sometimes I've gone to a workshop and just been uh, completely illuminated. Uh, I thought uh, Charles Staley's boot camp uh, down there was in 2003 in Las Vegas. Um, every single speaker kept coming around this same house. And what's funny is that I felt like in the middle of that was people like me. And that's when I really got a chance to, to, to learn more. It, got, it was the first time I'd been to a workshop in a while that wasn't a bodybuilding workshop or a high intensity, you know, one set to failure kind of thing. Um, we had gotten back to more to the tradition. So that's what I do. Write things down. Try to organize the big, the big, the cliche, the big rocks. And from there, 
see how that relates to everything else they're already doing. And knowing what you know now at 60, something you would tell your 47-year-old self to expect or to watch out for in the eyes of fitness and family, kids 16, 14, 13. You know, we're, we're not terribly different. I had, uh, when I was 47, I had 15, a 13-year-old. Um, yeah, do your best. Do your best to make sure that your kids don't pick up those cheap 40, 50 pounds of beer and pizza fat when they go off to college or, you know, when they start partying hard. <laughs> uh, trying to get rid of that 20-something obesity is a lifetime curse. Uh, and I'm very pleased that my daughters were both very good about uh, not doing that. Uh, both of them still train uh, every day. In fact, they just, my daughter Lindsay just gave me a call and gave me an update on her workout, which I find delightful. Um, uh, I have a free book on my website, danjohn.net. It's called uh, From Dad to Grad. Go in there, pull it out. It's a PDF. Look it over. There might be something in there, Carlos, that'll help you out. And remember, I'm here to help anytime. If there's anything specific, let me know. When I was 47, it was the best year of my life as an athlete. Um, what I would like to have said to myself then is that, uh, as always, this too shall pass. You know, uh, you're going to have to pay a high price for all those competitions. But uh, it, it all worked out. All right, thank you, Carlos. Good questions. We have a question from Dara. I'm wondering if you would recommend the barbell push press as my vertical press during easy strength. What are your thoughts on the push press? If it matters, I'm female, 40 years old, 125 pounds. Uh, actually, you know, just using that one thing, being female, I applaud it because many females, and there's nothing new about this, this is the research from the 40s and 50s, females tend to have a little issue with press and press numbers. By push pressing it, uh, you're going to grease the groove nicely. And uh, just reading this, Dara, uh, I'm, I want to make sure you look at my work on uh, easy strength for Olympic lifting, uh, which is on the site, uh, Dan John University. It's both in the workout generators and it's also an article. I think it's in the downloads, okay? And both of those will give you some insights about doing just that. Um, again, five days a week, but you'll notice that the numbers are much lower because when you do the push press and Olympic lift, you know, we're going to have to keep those numbers a little tighter, a little bit lower. Uh, for example, I think in many of the workouts, the clean and jerk is three singles. That's that's not very much load. Uh, vo uh, pardon me, not very much volume. I'm sorry, volume, but it's a lot of work. So yes, I think I think that's not a bad idea for you. Um, and then this last question, I, I I read this and I and I double checked it again. Also, do you have any experience or ideas on training someone with sickle cell? This is a question for a friend. Uh, boy, you know, for those who don't know, sickle cell anemia. Uh, was a uh, um, it, it, it remains a, a, a very difficult disease for, for a certain uh, a certain population. Um, now the reason, as I remember, that we we uh, evolved into it was that people with sickle cell are I hate to say immune, but have a better chance of dealing with malaria and some other uh, mosquito-borne illnesses. Uh, do I have any? Uh, Experience or I no no experience, but ideas. Well, the number one thing I would do is make sure you have good medical intervention. Um, you probably, uh, Dara, the person with sickle cell probably has to be a lot more. They have to track uh, things like their heart rate, maybe uh, and fatigue levels, much closer. Keep a real eye on them because one of the issues with sickle cell is going to be uh, endurance. So that would be the only one. I wish I knew more, but uh, in something like this, I always say, make sure you've got a good medical team behind you. And then number two, uh, certainly train. I, I think, I can't even imagine, I would, the human person loves to work out, loves to exercise, loves time alone, loves having a great, have fun, um, <laughs> loves a good night's sleep. That's universally true. Uh, so make sure that that's happening, okay? Um, I don't have any more to follow up, but if you find out anything more, would you share it with me and I'll share it with everybody else. Thank you. Mike has a question that, that shows up sometimes in the workshops, and it's a question I struggle with because 
that we used to have a joke with my friends. I, I got a cure for insomnia. Yeah, what is it? Sleep. So, um, Mike asks, while working out, what is the best way to breathe? Is nose breathing, both inhaling and exhaling, ideal? Or inhaling through your nose and exhaling through your mouth, better? What are your thoughts or supplements? Oh, okay. Yeah, on this whole thing, this shows up sometimes, Mike, and there's whole, there's whole fitness books written about the magic of the <sighs> inhale through the nose, exhale through the mouth. Um, and, I, and I know it's a good tool. Uh, at the kettlebell certs, I talk about uh, there's basically three kinds of breathing. You know, the the one I emphasize the most because of being an explosive athlete is that kind of breathing that where you you still maintain the bulk of your air, but you're using you're using your breath to help power things through. Um, there is that that focused recovery breathing, and then there's that third kind, that deep uh, you know breathing. Uh, I work with. Uh, ICU nurses, I do a work, a, a free training session for them every week. And because of COVID, these, these poor ladies and men are just stressed to the max. And I always worry when I have them do a breathing exercise like crocodile breathing. So you lay on your face on the ground and try to drive your lower back. So you try to make the person breathe, belly breathe by having them push the lower back as high as they can. And I always worry that uh, when they look up, they're going to be filled with tears because it's happened in my class. I, When they get done with just 15 breaths, they have an emotional response from all the stress they've been under. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, I can't remember the author who does such a good job with this, but truthfully, um, breathing is one of the few things you can control. And so I think there's value in learning to control your breathing as an athlete, but it has to be appropriate to what you're doing. As a discus thrower, it's going to be, you know, as an Olympic lifter uh, coming out of a big squat, uh, it's going to be like that. And then, of course, you have to make that dip slam when you get to the top and our stomp. That's going to be a little different. So every sport's going to have its own little thing. Uh, the second question, what are your thoughts on supplements as a whole? I've read that most don't really do too much, and I was just wondering if you had any knowledge in that field. Well, sure. I mean, I, I don't know if there's a supplement, Mike, I haven't done. And the truth is, most of them have absolutely no value at all. Um, if you respond to creatine, good for you, because many people I've worked with don't. Uh, I've been a huge fan of fish or krill oil for a long time, because I like what it does to my athlete's skin. Uh, I think I've mentioned this before, Mike, that I use, especially with adolescents, I look at their skin, I monitor. Now, I don't walk up and count zits or anything like that, but if I've noticed that all of a sudden I have a massive outbreak of my athletes, they're all, they're all getting uh, cystic acne, that's a real indicator that we are, we are burning the candle at both ends. Now, in an academic school, you'll notice that when finals come around, the kids break out real hard, and it seems remarkable. Uh, and they still want to train because of the, well, just like her, because of that, that, that's what that gives them. And I sometimes think that an hour, uh, if you're studying for finals, a one hour walk might do better for your academic rigor than another two pots of coffee. So, so I always recommended fish oil and krill oil to them as a skin support. And it, and it really seemed to work. But... Most supplements really don't do much. Uh, what do I take now? Now, I do supplement now with sauerkraut. I uh, I have a thank you to one of my listeners for this, but I'm doing uh, curry kimchi sauerkraut now. It's, it's really quite good, but I just, so twice a day I'm, I'm doing sauerkraut, and I would say I supplement with sauerkraut. Um, whenever I try digestives, uh, you know, those gummy digestives or whatever, um, I think because I'm so psychotic, I take way too many, and I pay a high price the next day for that. We won't discuss why. But uh, I've tried it all: apple cider vinegar, honey, uh, pills, vitamins, minerals. Uh, some minerals work pretty well. I have to say, magnesium, uh, calm. We have some calm right in here. I'm a big fan of Metamucil. It's a fiber supplement uh, to, to help certain people in certain times. Um, but supplement, supplement. And uh, I'm, I'm much more focused on supplements towards the peaking period when things start to fall off and if we can help out any way we can. What would I mean by that? In um, 
you know, if you're traveling a lot, hot, in planes, uh, your digestive system does get pretty messed up. So I'm much more, uh, I'm much more likely to recommend Metamucil to an athlete late in the season who's got to compete in hot weather. Um, in in the fall when they're partying every weekend and things are pretty relaxed, they probably don't need and have plenty of time every morning to do uh, the nature's work. Uh, then I don't worry about it as much. So <laughs> that sounds crazy, but uh, yeah, supplement supplement. If I said about a hundred years ago, if it works immediately, it's illegal. If it works within two weeks, it's banned. And if it works for health and longevity, how are you going to measure that? So here we go. Hope that helped. We have a question from Farrick. Do you have any coaching experience related to water polo? You know, I don't, but I was a, a, lucky to grow up in a neighborhood where a lot of my friends were into water polo big time in high school and post uh, uh, high school and college. So I grew up knowing water polo fairly well. And when I was in school, South City's water polo team was pretty good. And our football team, we would come in on certain days. Coach would you know, let us out early so we could go cheer on the team. Um, I'm a goalkeeper and I'm often being hit, dragged and tossed around. I'm thinking the armor building complex would be helpful but I'm not quite sure where I should put it in my training. Uh, Farrick, uh, you're gonna have to put weightlifting in where it's appropriate. I, um, I don't know what your off season is. So when I was young, uh, water polo was a fall sport. I, I don't know what it is now. But if it's a fall sport, you know, you should be doing all that six months out before the season starts. That's when you should be in the weight room. You know, I would be, yeah, armor building complex, that's the double kettlebell clean, the double kettlebell front squat, the double kettlebell uh, press, the 312. Yeah, that's that's a great one. Um, but you should really be thinking of all kinds of complexes. I wouldn't mind you seeing you do some dumbbell complexes, kettlebell complexes. You can look up the work of Pat Flynn. If you're on the site, go to the downloads and he's got all those kettlebell complex workouts in there. They might be really good for you. But this is a sports specific question that I don't really have enough information. But I think you're on the right track with complexes. Thank you, Fred. We have a question from Andy. I have an old elbow injury that has made cleans and front squats difficult. I'm planning on starting the Masters in Strength and Conditioning at St. Mary's in September. I will get on you, Andy. I'll be one of your teachers and I'll keep my eye on you. And we'll be tested on the Olympic lifts. I've been trying to repair by practicing lifts but catching the bar always flares up my elbow for a few days. Do you have any recommendations on drills I should be overcoming that? First off, hey, if it's still hurt, you gotta get that looked at, man. So Andy, rule one, I wanna get, I wanna get uh, some pictures on it. Uh, if it's something as simple as you need some manipulation, some work on it, whatever. But from there, I would start to look at two things. For one, uh, I'd like you to look at your shoulder flexibility. Now, I used to teach shoulder flexibility by doing all kinds of broomstick windmills and stuff. But now the number one thing I do is just that, is the hang. Boy, my arms look weird when I face that direction. Yeah. Um, it's, just the, it's just hanging from the pull-up bar. And people are always going to say, hang this way or hang that way. And it's like, I don't care, just hang. Uh, try to loosen that shoulder up, just for the, for the record. Anytime I work with somebody on an injury here, I always go in two directions at the same time. Uh, Two, we, we go in two opposite directions. I look at the joint above it, and I look at the joint below it. Now, hangs are really good. Let's see if that just a couple of weeks of hangs makes a difference. And the next thing, of course, is wrist and wrist flexibility. So everybody stretches their wrists this way, and that's great. But the truth is, the one I think that's even more important is stretching it this way. And here's a drill we use for years in the gym, is you grab the thumb, you just grab the thumb, and you try. I'm trying to turn my palm towards you. And now I'm just bringing my hand down my uh, chest and belly straight line. And when I get down to about here, I'm really racking it back. We also do all those, uh, we also stretch the sides um, on the floor. We lay, we lay our arms like this and stretch this way. And we lay our arms, and I hope we won't build it this way, and stretch it this way. And those are part of those things we call vents. But I would spend some quality time thinking about your shoulder and wrist flexibility. Um, the elbow, 
the elbow, I've been told, is uh, the hip is the best joint to hurt because uh, it's the easiest to fix. Uh, I've been told that the elbow is, uh, 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 the shoulder's the worst. So just, you know, some, <laughs> it's not the most scientific thing. <laughs> so if you have to hurt a, a joint, you want to hurt the hip, folks. And if you don't want to hurt a joint, don't hurt the shoulder, okay? But uh, try those two ideas. And then uh, if you get a chance, why don't you send me, get um, A, get the elbow looked at. Two, do those stretches a little bit. Three, once it feels okay-ish, if it's got to get better before port three, send me a video of your clean and let's look and see if there's some egregious activity you're doing, okay? Thank you. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Bye-bye. We have a question from Tim. And this is going to be an easy, easy question for me to answer. So let me just answer it right now. Tim, go to danjohn.net. Go to throws. Download the book, A Contrarian Approach to the Discus Throw. It's all there. But let's answer the question. I'm looking to start throwing the discus again after not throwing since the section meet during my senior year of high school 28 years ago. Mere child. I'm currently 46 years old. Remember, man, you know, i got to remind you on this, uh, Tim, that my best season was for, at 47, so you're doing fine. And just purchased a 2K discus. I did a few throws, and I seem to remember the basic technique like I've been throwing my whole life, like riding a bike or shooting a basketball. Um, he still plays competitive basketball with his son. What drills and training would you recommend for the discus after such a long layoff from throwing? I plan to just throw for the fun and improve my PR, but may enter some master's meets in the future. Yeah, uh, it's all right there for you. I, I do wish we still had that discus camp uh, for you to come train with us. Because a, a week intensive with us would really help you, uh, but we can't, so we don't. We won't. Um, in the contrarian approach to discus throw, I'm going to show you all kinds of drills. Uh, I'm going to want you to get a power ball. I want you to get an old tire. I want you to get a broomstick, and I want you to do the drills. I would suggest uh, in the beginning. Uh, of course, this if you're if you're uh, northern hemisphere, uh, you probably want to throw a lot now because of the weather, but Pretty soon, I want you to think about 90% of your work is just doing drills uh, and high reps on them. And the reason is, is you're not going to break yourself doing high reps. And uh, 500 turns with the broomstick tires and power balls takes you a tenth, a hundredth of the time as 500 real throws. So it'll be really good for you, you, you and you'll be able to get in fairly good shape. You really, at your age, you probably only need a couple exercises now. I'd say the farmer bars, the hills, and stuff like that for general work capacity. Um, I hope you can learn how to do that power clean I talk about in the book. And if you can do the overhead squat, boy, those those are the three, for me, for the adult thrower. Um, someone's going to ask me about presses, and yeah, sure, of course you need, presses are fine, but I'm, I'm convinced that he's going to press no matter what I say, so why, why coach it? Uh, overhead squat, farmer walk, power curl, and then throw, 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 uh, turn, 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 turn. Hope that helps, buddy. Thank you. Bye-bye. So we have a question from Seth. A few years back, I was diagnosed with a lateral tear on my left hip along uh, the FAI. Okay. I've historically been a very active individual, participating as a college football athlete and running 15 marathons, numerous other races over the past 15 years. Since my diagnosis a few years back, my activity levels in running and in general have decreased quite a bit as it depends, it depends on the particular day as to whether or not my hip feels up to activity. I understand that surgery may be in my future. Well, from what I'm reading, Seth, uh, may is a, uh, kind of a, an option, sure. But I've also tried to avoid that scenario up to this point. Do you have any strength exercises, routines, thoughts, feedback, that have proven successful, useful for individuals with the same FAI labral tear issue. Well, you're asking for medical intervention, so I won't do that. I just know that once somebody starts asking about this, uh, I generally tell them, uh, you'll, you're, I don't know how old you are. Um, I'm guessing you're probably in your late 30s, just doing the math, which is young for a total hip replacement, but... Uh, you know, the, the best advice I can give you is advice that I was given to me by my doctor. Um, you know, get yourself a glute loop 
and do lots of hip raises and clamshells. And uh, I, uh, I came up with something he liked a lot, goblet squats with this band around the knees. So you're pushing the knees out, which, uh, which he told me helped some of his patients uh, after THRs uh, retrain, uh, retrain their patterns. Uh, mini band walks with them with the mini bands around the socks, all that kind of stuff. But really, that's just uh, you know, if it's aching or hurting, you're blind with pain. If you start self medicating with uh, scotch uh, or bourbon, you know, which is not uncommon, um, I want you to start thinking in a different direction with you know real medical intervention. But there's not a lot we can do because, uh, like I've said many times. Um, of all the injuries you want to have, joint injuries, the one you want to have is the hip joint because that's the easiest one to fix. Um, shoulders are the worst as I understand it. And I, I imagine spines would be right there, but uh, the hip is the easiest. And you know, you might find yourself in a situation like I was where I put it off and put it off and put it off. And then all, all I had was uh, a lot of regrets for putting it off for so long. So I, and again, I'm not trying to get the total hip replacement but I'm just saying if that's the direction you're going um, just you know those those marathons that's just every marathon you run is going to be taking you closer and closer to the day I think um, boy I'd love to see you do something that was uh, unloaded uh, can, can you ride your bike can you do swimming um, this is tough because I know what it's like to have the you know the urge to compete but if you if it's something that's just so painful and so simple to fix, that's a tough one for me to to not advise you to go you know <laughs> under the knife. But I, I this is no this is not medical advice. This is me, you know, blah blah blah. Uh, good luck to you on this. Um, try the try the mini band stuff. Try the glute loop stuff. For me, it really it allowed me to not. Um, lose all that strength and hypertrophy so when I did get cut I was in fairly good shape okay sorry thank you very simple question from Scott what are your thoughts on the burden carry and that is bar in the back squat position yeah that, it was a really popular uh, back around 2000 2001 there was this thing called the Inman mile and people kept cha challenging themselves and some guy said he did it, but it was it was obviously he lied, and I don't remember all the story behind it now. But uh, you load up 150 percent of your body weight, and you walk a mile, uh, 1600 meters. I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, in my video, carried away, we demonstrate it. Uh, is there value to it? There's a lot of value to it. In fact, um, if you ever get into the strongman events, one's called the yoke carry. And I always thought the yoke carry was an outstanding movement. Uh, we used to we used Dave Draper's true squat bars, you know the, and so you could hold you could hold the weight like this, and then I've experimented. It doesn't it it looked like a great idea, but it it, it didn't work as well. But so you load up, let's just say sixty kilos, one hundred thirty five pounds, and then you put the chains that we had on it, and the chains we had were also collars, so it was weightlifting chains that weighed uh, 57 pounds, 25 kilos each, and we put those on the end. So as you walked, you got the whoo, whoo, uh, effect of those chains, which made you really have to walk down, and it really worked well for offensive linemen in American football. And I'm sure if you're a, a front row guy in rugby, you would, you would think there's some value to that too. Um, Looking at it and, and getting the feedback from the athletes, I thought, you know, this might be a good thing deep in the offseason for a thrower because it made you have to have so much anaconda strength. So, yeah, I think I think there's a lot of value to it. Uh, what are the downsides, Scott? How do you get that bar up there? That's, you know, if you're out there in the park by yourself. and you, um, Now, in my situation, I just bring the squat racks out. So, But, uh, you know, if you have to clean, if you have to clean it, push jerk it, bring it down behind your neck, that's going to impact the load a bit. But yeah, they're, they're great. Um, it might be just as easy to load up a big backpack and go for a walk. We have a question from Stru. For us, I got things to do other than becoming an Olympic weightlifter, but I want to be stronger than all my neighbor's people in terms of longevity and everyday strength. 
Does it matter if one does pull-ups or chin-ups? Same with vertical horizontal press, bench press, shoulder press. A press is a press. Does it matter which one I do? Do I have to train both movements or can I just stick to the one that's easiest and fun? Yeah, I'm not sure about what you're trying to say, but uh, I, I, all of it, but it's true. I think, I think what you're trying to say is, do you have to do the Olympic lift? Do you have to do every lift? No. In fact, that's one of the things that I've discovered in my life is that, uh, you know, I love the bench press and I, uh, for, I mean, I had a massive love affair with it. And then when I met Dick Notmeyer, I didn't bench press again for seven or eight years. Yet when I did, I was stronger than when I stopped bench pressing and I was a really good bench presser. Uh, what, what I realized that any, any overhead work I did made me keep my bench press. Uh, I never back squatted in my career until they told me to do so at the Olympic Training Center. And I look back now and it's probably the worst decision I made in my life. But with the, with the front squat from Olympic lifting, I could back squat anything. I mean, I was, I was a great back squatter never doing it. But I also had the mobility and flexibility from doing the front squat. So when I look back on, and as, I, as I'm trying to unpack what I'm trying to say here, is I, I like your point. Can you come up with a, just some basic, easy things and, and make a career of it? Well, yeah. I mean, Marty Gallagher, he has that great article at Raw on one workout a week where the guys do um, squat, bench press, deadlift, see you next week. And they're making progress. So, yeah, it's really possible to, to do minimal training programs. And if you, if you go to the generator at Dan John University, you'll notice I say push, pull, hinge, squat, loaded carry. I mean, I prefer overhead pushes. I, I think you should push, you know, vertical, military press, pull-ups. Um, the, the hinge for most people should be a deadlift variation. I like the rack deadlift, deficit deadlift. The, the, the trap bar deadlift, of course, now I'll get 100 emails. Why do you like the trap bar deadlift? Uh, personally, I just do the goblet squat now and overhead squats. I don't, I don't do anything else. Yeah, I mean, I do a lot of overhead squats. And then loaded carries, of course, is always foundational. But honestly, couldn't I just train? Uh, dear Dan, can't you just train by doing uh, clean and press, pull up, trap bar deadlift, and uh, go for a walk? Yeah. Because that's the program I just put together called uh, Easy Strength for Fat Loss. It can't be that simple. So yeah, I think so. Uh, I'm still the strongest person I generally know. It's unusual and I'm not the strongest. And I mean, I look at the workouts I do and they're very, they're very clean. So uh, there's not a lot of junk in them. So yeah, I think you can, it's true. Pat asks a question that I think is coming up a lot lately. I've been using Easy Strength to get back to my pre-quarantine lifting numbers, and all in all, it's going pretty well. I've been wanting to set up, uh, I've been wanting to up my strapless deadlift numbers, but I've been having trouble with the hook grip. My one rep maximum with wrist straps was 500, but without straps, also neutral grip. I don't like supinating my hand. Okay. My grip struggles with 315 for five reps. Any tips you could offer to improve my hook grip would be greatly appreciated. Pat, you've fallen into the standard trap of using straps and telling me that's your personal record. And I got nothing against it. I, I don't mind it. In fact, uh, I've often thought if I ever go back to coaching a certain kind of athlete, we would be strapped up from day one. But uh, it's not unusual. You have almost a 200 pound difference uh, between your strapped and unstrapped. That's a lot, but it's not unusual. Because when you have the straps, um, the amount of wiring you have between your brain and your grip is enormous. Uh, type in homunculus man and you'll see these massive hands, massive feet, massive genitalia, massive eyes. Because according to your, your brain, those are the most important things out there and the most intricate things. So by putting on straps, you allow the brain to focus just right up to the posterior chain, you know, right up, you know, right up to what T.H. White says in The Sword and the Stone, all power, you know, comes from the nape of the neck, you know. Um, how are you going to improve your grip? Well, I would suggest real simple, uh, this is what we did, and this is very simple. Either get thick bars, which are expensive, or get those things online called fat grips or something like that. So these little 
there's these little things you stick on a traditional Olympic bar, but you instead of being able to hold it here, you have to hold it here. Now you're asking about the hook grip, and I get that. But by having you really focus on the C grip here, the C letter C C grip, okay? No thumb, C grip. Okay. C grip, no thumb grip, all right? Standard grip, deadlift grip, hook, hook grip, okay? Hook grip. Um, by focusing on the thick grip, for whatever reason, our deadlift numbers took off, especially with the adolescent athletes. So I'm wondering if instead of worrying about the hook grip, which you should, you should be doing the hook grip a lot, but by having maybe a, so have a normal workout with the hook grip and then the next workout be a thick bar only, one of the things you'll find is that your technique in the deadlifts improves because you can't do anything wrong with a thick bar. Uh, other than that, the way we got our hook grip strong is that Dick Notmeyer had me uh, snatch and clean and jerk for about two and a half hours a day, five days a week. And weirdly, my grip got strong. And weirdly, I had a hard time sleeping at night. And weirdly, <laughs> I was sore all the time. So uh, don't go to the extreme I went to. Try the little idea I gave you. Okay? Thank you. We have a question from Amanda. Thanks for answering my previous podcast questions. Since March, I have lost 10 pounds of fat and gained muscle by eating more vegetables in any format, exercising at home five days a week, limiting alcohol to the weekends, and a daily 10,000 step goal. You know, Amanda, I'd like to have you as the poster child for everything we try to teach. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thanks again for providing reminders, shark habits, and pirate, private math, pirate math, it says pi, uh, private math, pirate, pirate, you know, you know, er, yo ho, pirate maps for all the listeners. I wanted to ask you about your Metamucil two week challenge went. You mentioned it in Wandering Weights episode 284, but I don't recall hearing any additional updates on it. Well, that's so, <laughs> well, I'm really, I'm a big believer that <clears throat> there's probably a triad of fat loss. Um, boy, it's tough to figure out which one's the most important. So let's just make it equally important. The first, the big one is sleep and recovery. Um, I was at a thing one time and I was the only person at the round table who didn't have to wear a COPD mask every night. And I thought, how can you get good sleep if you have to have a machine breathe for you? And again, it's, this is a life-saving thing, so I'm not ripping on it. But I'm such a big believer in sleep, napping, meditation for fat loss. And the reason is, is because if you're trying to do one of the most difficult things to ask the human body, get rid of fat, you've got to have, you've got to convince the body that to release it, oh, we're doing fine, things are great, uh, don't, we, there is no famine on the way, you don't need to store all this fat. <sighs> Stress levels down. The second thing, obviously, is, well, it's not as obvious, but I think you need to have an exercise program that includes uh, releasing fatty acids followed by <laughs> the body eating those fatty acids. That's why I like short, intense work followed by a long walk. And in the third area, I used to say nutrition, but now I'm to the point, let's just say gut, gut biome, okay? And uh, so that's why I eat the sauerkraut every day. That's why I eat a piece of fruit. Uh, I have these strategic, uh, about two a day where I eat sauerkraut and a piece of fruit. Um, to and I try to. I'm now changing the fruits around. Uh, I, eat, I strive for eight different vegetables every day. It's just you know, I'm just trying my best to do these simple things to get my body where it needs to be. But uh, I, I think, and, and the new research coming out supports it a little bit, Amanda, is that one of the things, the struggles we have in America today, and I'm, I'm certainly true, I'm sure it's true in a lot of our uh, other countries that you know share the, the north. Um, is our gut biomes are in bad shape uh, between the use of overuse of antibiotics. When I was young, you would get antibiotics for everything, including acne. Um, the uh, the the weird pesticides we have in our in our foods. The in the United States, you know, it's real hard to find un unprocessed food. It's very hard to find unprocessed food, and so what happens is is that I think people's gut biomes are becoming. Uh, 
uh, kind of weak, uh, not strong enough. And so it's our job to do certain things. I, I read an interesting thing. The one guy took up gardening just to get his hands dirty because he felt that having dirty hands made his body fight harder and he and his wife lost some weight doing their own gardening. I mean, I, I would just stop there because there's other factors obviously too. He and his wife, so your social relationships are better. Gardening is less stressful. Eating fruit you grew, uh, food you grew probably better. But uh, the reason I took on that Metamucil challenge was I had read that that by itself might be a really good idea to impact your gut biome. Now, I have to be careful because at the time I was doing these two gut biome snacks a day, the sauerkraut or kimchi plus a piece of fruit, and I added the, the Metamucil, but uh, I mean, the fact that in the two-week period, my blood pressure and my cholesterol, the the LDL went down a little bit, and, but still, you can never cholesterol tests over. You know, it's like it's like it's, it's like a heart rate. You know, it, they they tend to flow up and down with all kinds of reasons. Blood pressure, you never know. I can raise my blood pressure really easily by going and donating blood, because when I donate blood, my blood pressure goes really really high, because I know. I'm going to be sitting on a table for, well, this, the thing I do called power red. I'll be sitting on a table for two hours staring at a needle in my arm. And that just, oh, right there, my blood pressure went up. So, yeah, I found it to be a, a nice little thing. I continue to do it. When I travel now, Amanda, I buy those little uh, to-go packets. Um, and I got to tell you, I don't know of anything you can do easier. Uh, now, I know some people disagree with me, and that's fine. But my job, I've always felt, is to be the person who's out there trying to learn new things. So, yeah, it worked well. It's very inexpensive. And uh, let's just say every day, every morning is rewarding, okay? <laughs> You're the light. Thanks for listening, and thanks for asking questions. Bye-bye. Well, thank you. I hope you got something out of that. Uh, remember, if you have questions, email them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. I'm happy to answer any appropriate question. And if you can, if you look in the archives at YouTube, I may have already answered your question already. So thank you.